I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9 simply as a starting point. I'm not going to preach on Ephesians 1 9 necessarily, but there's a word in there that uh, I want us to talk about or think about tonight. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will uh, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. In other words, this verse is saying that God had a will, a plan, a desire that was kept secret or was a mystery, but it is now made known. And we're going to talk about that word mystery. And we're going to look at it in several different uh, uses in the Bible so that we fully understand it. And uh, the English word really is uh, the word that means secret. If you take Strong's Concordance and check it out, cross-reference it, uh, that will be a definition that's given to the word. Now, the idea here is that it was something that was kept secret. Uh, it was something that was only known to God the Father uh, throughout, uh, throughout time until he made it known. So Paul said in verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery uh, of his will. And then he goes on to talk about what it is. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, the same word uh, means concealed, something that is concealed. Uh, something that, uh, that is concealed that can be revealed. And that's why when you get in the book of Revelation, you start seeing a, a mystery talked about and the seals are being opened. And Daniel was told to seal the book and shut it up until the time that those things were to be revealed or to be made known. Now, it is evident, I believe, that God has made His, no, His will known at different times. The book of Hebrews says that at sundry times and in diverse manners, God spake. So there were certain times God made certain things known. Hebrews chapter 1 and uh, verse 1 and 2. But uh, he has also kept certain things secret and revealed them from time to time according to his purpose and his counsel. So God never revealed everything at one time. Um, you and I have the completed Bible, but believe me, there's a lot of it that is still secret as far as we're concerned. And if you don't believe it, try the visions of Ezekiel back there in the Old Testament. I haven't read anybody that has a handle on that stuff. And uh, you get in the book of Revelation, there's things that, uh, you know, you just, you, you get a headache trying to figure them out. But you know the time is going to come when those things will be perfectly clear. And, uh, but God has not made, uh, made it clear on what those things are at this time. And so uh, uh, he reveals things from time to time according to his own purpose and according to his own counsel. And you'll notice then that uh, there are several things that were concealed or they were secret uh, and they're referred to in the New Testament as well. Now, number one is it is, used in, uh, it is used of the secrets of the kingdom. And, uh, and, uh, but those things uh, had been concealed until the Lord Jesus Christ revealed them to his disciples. I want you to go to Matthew with me. And uh, in Matthew chapter 13, we have what we call the parables of the kingdom of heaven. Now, these are not the parables about the church. And uh, you just, just get this idea out of your mind that the church and the kingdom are synonymous. They are two different things. And the kingdom here is talking about primarily about the, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Uh, here in uh, Matthew chapter 13. And if you look down at verse 10, he said to his disciples, he said, it is given, he said unto them, it is because it is given unto you to know the mysteries. Now the you there is not talking about you or me, it's talking about the 12 apostles because they're the ones that ask the question. Look at verse 10. And the disciples came and said, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he said, well, because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, then if you look down at verse 11, uh, and, and well, verse 10 and 11, and you'll notice then that, uh, that something had not been known before about the kingdom 
that was being offered to Israel. And the thing that was unknown is that the kingdom would be rejected. It was unknown that it would be rejected and that there would be a long interval between this rejection and it being set up in its glory. This is something that was unknown to any, no man knew that. Now they knew they would reject the Messiah in the Old Testament, but listen, you are reading those things back into the Old Testament. It's clear to you simply because you're looking back now through the telescope of the New Testament. But if you were in the Old Testament and you didn't have any of the revelation of the New Testament, you would have responded exactly as the apostles did. And why wouldn't you? Now, we sometimes say, well, how could they be so blind? Well, they didn't have all the light that you've got. That's why Simon Peter, when Jesus said the Son of Man's going to be crucified and rejected and all of that, Peter began to rebuke him and say, that's not so. So those things were not understood that there would be a rejection of the kingdom and that there would be a long interval between the rejection of Jesus Christ and the establishment of this messianic kingdom that was offered to them. And that is the mystery. And this was unknown. And it was concealed from even from the prophets. I want you to go to 1 Peter with me. Well, way over to the right. And, uh, but I want you to see this. In, uh, and if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew. Uh, you feel free to use it. <clears throat> but uh, look at 1 Peter and, uh, in chapter 1 and verse 10 and 12. 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. This is the Old Testament prophets. They would write the Bible, they would write scripture, and then they would search their own writings to try to understand them. And uh, <clears throat> this is talking about the salvation of the millennial kingdom. It says, they prophesied of the grace that should come to you, verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified before and the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now do you see what that last statement says? The suffering of the Messiah and the glory that should follow. They could not reconcile that. Even the Old Testament prophets, they searched that. They couldn't figure it out. And if you remember in Luke's, uh, uh, on the, in the Luke's gospel on the Emmaus Road, when Jesus is talking to the men as they walk along the road and they're sad, he said, what manner of reasoning is this? And you're sad and so on. Then he said, ought not Christ, ought not the Messiah, to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? They didn't understand those things. That was a mystery that the Messiah would be rejected by Israel and that there would be a long interval between, the establish, between that rejection and the establishment of the kingdom. But the parables of Matthew 13 explain what will be going on as far as the kingdom is concerned, not the church, what would be going on during, that, during his absence. Now listen, let me just back up. If there'd never been a church, if the church of God as we know it had never been in the plan of God, Jesus Christ would have been rejected. Israel would have rejected the kingdom. Jesus would have gone back to heaven. And the kingdom in mystery form would have, a, would have been going on with the absence of Christ. And the absence of Christ. And you would have had the things going on in Matthew chapter 13 and all those parables. And then he would come back at the end of them. Now, so when you read in the parables of Matthew 13 in his absence, we're not talking about the church in those parables. We're talking about what, will be go what was going on in the early part of the book of Acts and what will be going on after the rapture of the church up till the very return of Jesus Christ at the second advent. That is the absence. How long will that absence be? Well, before the ch when the church was established there in the book of Acts, it was a few years where the kingdom was still being offered. Now, when the church is raptured, we, have, we don't have any scriptural uh, uh, teaching that the, king, that the tribulation will kick in at that time. It may. That is a standard teaching. You know, the rapture takes place and the tribulation kicks in. That may be true. 
but we don't have any proof of that in Scripture. It could be years after the rapture of the church before the actual 70 weeks of Daniel starts. It could be, because we don't have any Scripture either way. And so, but that, that, that gap is there. So that is the secret, that is the mystery that it talks about here in Matthew chapter 13 when he talks about the mysteries of the kingdom. All right? Secondly, and if you'll turn to Romans chapter 11, you'll notice there that he talks about the, uh, about the blindness of Israel. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11. And let's see. I don't think I wrote down the Bible verse, but we'll find it here in a minute. That blindness in part has happened to Israel, the mystery. I forgot to write down the verse. Is it 25? Thank you, brother. All right. Look at Matthew. Uh, look at Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. This is a secret. That is something that was not understood or revealed. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so... This uh, mystery here is, is connected with the duration of this blindness, you see. Now, we just, we just got through in the mystery of the, of the kingdom that there would be a, that there would be a, um, um, a parenthesis there. But Paul now reveals that during this church age that there is a blindness on the part of the nation of Israel. And this blindness itself was not a secret. It had been told in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 and 10 but the duration of that blindness was always a mystery it was always a secret how long would it last and he tells you Paul reveals to you how long that blindness is going to last and it's going to last until the times of the Gentiles uh, be fulfilled and um, so that kind of gives you a how long is Israel going to be in darkness as a nation well it's going to be until the second advent See? until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That's how long it's going to take place. Number three, uh, this mystery is also used in connection with the resurrection, which had never been made known before to the sons of men. Now, in, in John 11, you'll notice when Jesus heals Lazarus there in Bethany, uh, Jesus told her, he said, you know, if you believed what I said, uh, you would see, uh, you know, the Son of Man. Uh, you would see Him alive in 11, I think it's 1125. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me. And verse 27, and she said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And uh, I want to back up again. If you look at verse 24, And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she had a belief in the resurrection in Matthew 11 and verse uh, 24. She believed there would be a general resurrection. But there was something about the resurrection that she didn't know. And the Lord reveals what it is in verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And so this is something about the resurrection. It, it is a mystery that was made known even though she believed in the resurrection, she didn't understand that those who would live and remain unto the coming of Christ would never die. This is something they didn't understand. And she did not understand, as verse 26 tells us. Now, in Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, we find that uh, we're not left in ignorance as a church concerning this matter. Because Paul picks up on this and he uses the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and explains them. And then when you come to 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you get more light on it. So the Lord, uh, the Lord uh, reveals something on it uh, by, uh, by speaking of it. And then Paul said something in 1 Thessalonians about it. And then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the last part of the chapter... He says, I'm going to show you a mystery or make something known to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and down about verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. 
Now what he's saying here is I'm going to show you something simply that was not revealed before. That's all he's saying. What I'm saying to you has never been revealed before. And now the, the secret is out. And here's what it is. It says, we shall not all sleep. In other words, not everybody's going to die before the coming of the Lord. Not everybody has to die. Uh, but we shall all be changed. Now, no one understood or even had an, uh, any idea how this is possible, how it was going to take place. You could never get it in the Old Testament. You couldn't get it in the Gospels. But this mystery, this secret was revealed to the Apostle Paul. And he says, we don't all have to die, but we're going to all be changed. We're going to be transformed. And then he goes on to talk about it in verse 22. He says, that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet will sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this is a mystery, a secret, something that was unknown. And, uh, in, and up until this time, you know, the idea was that everybody had to die, that everybody was going to die. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. So that was the concept. And so when he said to, to her, your brother will live again, he said, I know that he'll live again in the resurrection at the last day. And uh, so he clarified that, I believe. Another uh, issue, another secret, uh, is, that, uh, is the matter that uh, wickedness would coexist side by side. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and uh, <clears throat> chapter 2. I can find Thessalonians here. I had it a minute ago. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and down about verse uh, 7. Um, he says that for the mystery of iniquity doth already work and only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way the part we're concerned about is the mystery of iniquity once again he's saying that there is a secret about the coexistence of evil uh, working alongside in the millennial kingdom and that these two things that these two things uh, uh, Will, will exist at the same time during the kingdom, during the uh, mystery part of the kingdom of heaven. And even in his day, in the part of the book of Acts, the lawlessness was already at work. And of course the kingdom was being offered at that same time as well. So it was already working during the dispensation covered by Acts. And uh, had the nation repented, at the call uh, of, to the gospel in Matthew 22, 4, uh, then, uh, then the, the lawlessness of the lawless one, who is the Antichrist, would have come to an end, ultimately. It would have been fulfilled. It would have come to a full. As you read about uh, so many times, you read about it in Daniel, and you read about it in the book of Revelation, and so on. But now that kingdom is in has been postponed so he calls it the mystery of iniquity again the mystery is that wickedness and lawlessness would be side by side with the kingdom of heaven running parallel side by side that's why again in those parables in Matthew you read about the leaven in the bread you read about the tares among the wheat. Uh, you read about the birds uh, in the tree. And in those parables you see, even though he's talking about the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, you see wickedness in it. And so it's there. See, their concept once again was that, that even though they didn't understand this absence and that there would be a period of time between the rejection of Christ and his kingdom, and his actual return to set up the king, they didn't understand that, so their, their concept was that Christ would set up his kingdom while he was there on earth, that he would not be crucified, and that evil would be put down. And uh, 
their enemies would be destroyed. And so these are some of the things that, that, uh, that uh, were being revealed. And, uh, but now these things, talking about these two things, are postponed. Now even in the church today, the church today you have, you have saved people. And you know there's application. You have saved people and you have lost people. Uh, you, have, uh, you have that in the, the actual uh, new local churches. And you have it in the professing church uh, of Christianity. And uh, so there's application, things that are parallel. That, that's why I think that they're so similar that it's easy for people to, con uh, to confuse them and assume that they are the same. But they're not the same. The kingdom is not the church. The mysteries concerning the kingdom are not the mysteries concerning the church. And so it's important that we understand uh, those, uh, those uses. Um, now, the, 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 the secret or the mystery that you and I are concerned about is the one that is revealed during the, during the Acts period. And uh, we really only learn about it in Paul's writings. And that is what we call uh, concerning the church. If you go to Romans with me, Romans chapter 16, Paul makes reference to it. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 16, and uh, look down about verse 25. Romans 16, 25. He says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So there was a secret or a mystery, same thing, that was only known to God. It was, perp it was in God's purpose, but He never made it known until He made this one known to the Apostle Paul. None of the twelve apostles knew this mystery. It was never revealed to them. It wasn't known in the early part of the book of Acts. In fact, it was never known until after the conversion of the Apostle Paul. And so he says, Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. My gospel. And that is a different gospel than you find in the, in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In their gospel, during that period, there never was any mention of the death, burial, and, uh, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for sins. You will not find anywhere in the four Gospels where anyone preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. You won't find it. It isn't there. It's the same thing, you know. We read, we, we're, so, we're so confident as we read the, the writings of Paul and we get this in our mind, then we go back and we read the Gospels and we read it back into the Gospels. And therefore, assuming it's there. But it isn't there. Just as the things we were talking about, the kingdom, were not in the Old Testament. The things I've said about the kingdom. Now, granted, most of the Old Testament is about the kingdom. But the mystery things about the, mystery things about the kingdom were, not, uh, were unknown. Alright? So we notice he says in other ages, the other ages were kept secret uh, since the world began. And um, I want you to go with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3 again. Back to Ephesians chapter 3. And look at verse, uh, verse 5. Ephesians 3, 5. Talking about the same thing. You got it? Okay, 3, 5. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. You got it? Ephesians 3, 5. Uh, I'm sorry, 3, 3. And then in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, but is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now the holy apostles and prophets in this text are not talking about the twelve apostles. You have 12 apostles that Jesus picked, then Judas was replaced with Matthias. 
you have those 12 who are kingdom apostles. Then you have the apostle Paul, who was never one of the 12. And then you have, I think, about eight or nine other apostles mentioned in Paul's writings. And none of them are the, of the 12. So it is to Paul and these apostles that this mystery was revealed. My point is, again, in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known. So there was something that was kept a secret from the foundation of the world. Therefore, it was never preached or, or seen or understood in the Old Testament, nor in the four Gospels, or in the early part of the book of Acts. It was never there. It was always in the mind of God according to His purpose. Look down at verse 9 in the same chapter. Well, let's see. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery or this secret that he's been talking about. He said, my ministry is to make all men see, understand what the fellowship of this mystery is. That's my ministry. Now that is why the Apostle Paul was rejected by so many of his own brethren. During the Acts period, he said, no man stood with me. And the reason is because of Paul's gospel and his revelations. Because his gospel and his revelations were uh, in addition and different from what was being preached and taught by the gospel of the kingdom. Now, you know what we've got going on in Christianity today? We have got a mixture is because Christians do not understand these things that we're talking about tonight. They cannot clearly distinct, distinguish them and divide them. They mix them. It's kind of like goulash. You've heard me talk about my wife's goulash. And that is where you just take everything and throw it in the pan and you mix it up. And so Christians can be easily confused if you're not able to make those distinctions. If you don't know who you are and you don't know what you've got, then you can be in serious trouble. And that's why it's so important that, you under, that we understand these. But he says in verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And so he's been talking about a mystery. But we haven't told you what that mystery is. But the hint is in the word fellowship. But we haven't told you what that mystery is yet. If, um, and uh, I want you to go to Colossians over to the right, to Colossians chapter 1, and look down about verse 26. <clears throat> Colossians 1, 26. He says, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest unto his saints. There was a mystery, a secret, that was hid from all generations. Paul says, now, now, in his time, it was being made manifest. It's not being made manifest necessarily in your time. It's already been made manifest. But it was never made manifest before the revelation that came to the Apostle Paul. And that's what he said, how that by revelation, God revealed it to him. And uh, so there are scriptures that talk about this. We looked, at Matthew, we looked at Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, and also Ephesians, and here in Colossians chapter 1. Now... As to the mystery itself, uh, it is certain that it cannot refer to the blessings of the Gentiles uh, in connection with Israel. Because the Bible in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 12, talks about the blessings that would come to all nations through Abraham and his seed. So that was not a mystery. It was never a mystery that the Gentiles would be saved. That is not a mystery. In fact, you can read all through the Old Testament where God 
said in prophecy he was going to save Gentiles. So that certainly is not a mystery. That was never a secret. And, uh, you know, and God, as I said, made that known throughout the Old Testament. And I don't have time to look at all the references tonight, but there's, you can look and check it and see if you look at chapter 12 in the book of Revelation and try a cross-reference, you'll be able to find reference after reference throughout the Old Testament where God promised that, uh, that He would save them. Now in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, it is stated that, that it was now being revealed. Now what I, I said earlier is that means that it could not have been revealed then before that time. Now meant it was being revealed in Paul, to Paul and at his time. And uh, it could not be revealed um, uh, before that. And, uh, and so in connection with the Gentiles, it was revealed unto his holy apostles. And I mentioned who those are. And uh, the, that the Gentiles would be fellow or, jo fellow or joint heirs with Christ in one body. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 3 with me again. And here he actually tells you what this mystery is. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6. And this will, I think, nail it down. Verse 5, Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6, That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promises by the gospel. Now here is the mystery. The mystery that Paul is talking about is that the Gentiles would be in one body with Jews and they would be in the same fellowship and be partakers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that does not mean that Jew Gentiles move over and become Jews. It doesn't mean that Judaism goes on and that we are now grafted into Judaism. We are not grafted into Judaism. Judaism has been set aside. And God started a brand new thing that was never known and never revealed. It is called the church, the body of Christ. And that church, that body, was never known to man. And, and in that body, the church, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. In Judaism, there is a distinction between Jew and Gentile. A Gentile can't even go into the temple in Judaism. You get it? Even if he is converted to Judaism, he's still a Gentile. He still does not have rights as a Jew has. That's why you have the court of the Gentiles. See? So don't kid yourself. A Gentile could be converted to Judaism, but he still did not have full privileges. Nor will he have in the millennium. Nor will he have in eternity. Judaism is something altogether different. And there's movements going on today trying to get Gentiles to come back in, even though they believe in Christ, and start practicing uh, some of the uh, uh, practices of Judaism. I know what I'm talking about. There's a Hebrew movement, and I believe they're born-again Christians, possibly. But what they're doing is they're still under the Sabbath teaching and the dietary teaching and some of these things. And many Gentiles are falling for it and getting back into it. That's exactly what was going on in the book of Galatians. So you need to understand that we are not part of Israel. We are not part of Judaism. The church is a brand new thing, independent of Judaism. Christ established it. Paul is the apostle to that church, that body. And when you are saved, there is no distinction in that church body. Male or female, bond or free, Jew or Gentile, makes no difference. In the church, everybody is on equal ground. You understand what I'm talking about? 
This man cannot get any closer to God than his wife. She has every privilege in Christ that he has. You follow me? A Jew, would, if a Jew is there and he's saved, he doesn't have any privileges. None whatsoever. He, is, he, has, he only has the same privileges I have. And I don't have any that he doesn't have. So that's what he's talking about is the mystery here. And this thing was never known. And that is why even, the, even Simon Peter had so much trouble with that thing. As we, as we continue our studies through the book of Acts, you'll see it more and more. All right? So uh, this mystery then, as I said, was revealed to Paul and those apostles. And that mystery was that Jews and Gentiles would become a joint heirs in one body called the church, the body of Christ. And all saved people, thank God, in that body. Open Door Baptist Church is just a drop in the ocean of born-again believers. Now, I believe in local churches. Local churches are God's plan. The letters were written to local churches. And Paul told, uh, told Timothy to ordain elders and pastors and so on. And so the local church is God's plan. And it's the local church where we fellowship together. It's where we study the Word of God together. We worship together. We send missionaries out from the local churches. See? But thank God, people uh, of all denominations who've trusted Christ are saved and part of that body. And there's no distinction. Does that make sense to you? All right. Now, you know, there, uh, as I said, we cannot know the whole purpose of God in uh, keeping this concealed throughout the ages. Uh, but one thing I think is clear that had God made it known before Israel, uh, you know, before Israel uh, accepted him, I think Israel would have had an excuse. Could you imagine... A coach saying to his team, he knows his team's going to get, they are going to get stomped. They're going to get tromped. I remember one time when uh, my boy was, or Randy was going to uh, King's Garden. He's quarterback. I think he weighed about 129 pounds, fully suited up and full of bananas. I mean, he just, you know, a puff of wind come across the football field and blow him away. And, uh, and uh, they went up to Darrington to play the high school team up there. Those guys are loggers. It was pathetic. My son Randy, he'd just grab the football and run the other way, you know. I mean, it, you know, looked like the Hulk coming after him. And they got beat about 65 to nothing. It was pathetic. I didn't want him to get in the car with me. I was ashamed of him. Now, I guarantee you, that coach knew they were going to get stomped. Don't you know that? Can you imagine him getting them in the huddle and saying, now let me tell you something, fellas. These guys are going to kill you. You're going to lose about 65 to nothing. And some of you are going to get some bones broken, maybe killed. But get out there and give your best. What do you think that pep talk would do? Now, God knew that Israel would reject the kingdom. He always knew that he had another plan that was always kept secret. And that there was another apostle that he would save called Paul. And that he would start what we know as the church, the body of Christ. Now, had Israel re accepted Christ and the kingdom, there would be no church today. There'd be no need for it. There'd be no need for it. But God in His wisdom, and when you get to thinking this thing through, God in His wisdom not only showed how Israel would reject Him all through the prophets, and then He revealed there would be a period of time, and in that absence of the king and the rejection period, He would start a brand new thing, to where whosoever will may come. And it's the, it's the easiest thing in the world to get saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. God says, I'm going to make absolutely no difference between anybody. Jesus died his blood, even though he died for Israel, to set up the covenant and the kingdom. They rejected it. His blood is still going to pay for every sinner who will have it. 
and I'm going to start a brand new thing and I'm going to show my grace to mankind and guess what the angels in heaven bend down and behold this mystery we sing about it